This talk is Looking into the Eye of the Meter with Don Weber. Please remember to silence your cell phones. If uh, you're standing in the back, if there are seats available, please sit down. And please, please, please remember the feedback forms. The, all feedback forms get reviewed. This conference is about you, and we need your feedback to make it better every year. And without further ado, Don Weber. Am I on? Okay, excellent. Hang on, let me just start this real quick. I've got a process. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody for coming out. Uh, like I said, my name's Don Weber, uh, and we're going to be talking about smart meters. So how many of you know whether or not you have a smart meter on the side of your house? Let's see a raise of hands and have everybody look around. Look at that. I mean, it's getting more prevalent. You know, as the days go by, more and more are getting deployed all the time. Uh, when I first started working with the smart meter, the, the first thing I did when I picked one up, I was looking at Matt Carpenter. He was uh, trying to help me understand them. Um, he told me, pick that one up and, and take it apart. But as soon as I picked it up, I noticed that there was two IR LEDs on the front of it. I'm like, what are these? It's like, oh, that's the uh, optical port. Well, what does it do? Well, well, if a field technician needs to go out and gather information from the meter, what he's going to do is he's going to walk up and he's going to put an optical probe on it. He's going to use his computer to pull configuration data from it or to actually configure it. I was like, well, can we talk to it? He's like, well, you have to have uh, the meter manufacturers, uh, their own software. There's proprietary software for, for each meter. I was like, well, does it do anything we want it to do? And he's like, no. He's like, we want to work on this, don't we? Yes, we do. And so ever since that point, you know, the optical point has been weakening at me, and that's why I called it looking into the eye of the meter. Uh, as we said earlier, my name is Don Weber. Um, I work for InGuardians. They brought me on specifically on board because I'm really good at learning new technologies, and they needed somebody to help them with uh, smart grid assessments, particularly in the advanced metering infrastructure, AMI. Uh, I've got a background in se security management, really good background in incident response management. And so they, brought, so they knew I had all the skills I needed to help our, help our clients move forward, but we also needed to start doing a lot more work into the hardware, and that's what I've helped them with over the last two years. This is the talk that was stopped at ShmooCon. Obviously, I didn't get a phone call. That's one of the reasons why I was looking at my phone, to uh, make sure that they weren't calling us at the last second again. Um, I haven't, I've changed this presentation only by adding one bullet. One of our clients said, hey, you forgot to uh, tell, us, uh, tell them about something right here. And so I said, okay, absolutely, I need to do that. I need to add that bullet. So uh, I'll, I'll point that out to it uh, when we get there. Um, but uh, actually, the only thing that really came out of the vendor talk, speaking with the vendor, is that we decided not to release the tool publicly, um, that we to only release it to people within the industry, vendors, uh, utilities and researchers that we can validate are working on uh, for utilities uh, on these on smart meter assessments. So that's so that's really the only change that came out of that. And obviously, they haven't given us a phone call. So obviously, we uh, alleviated some of their fears. So driving on, we're not going to talk about any specific vulnerabilities in meters. We're not going to talk about any particular vendor. We're not going to talk about our clients, okay? Because it doesn't really matter. These are things. But we're going to talk about us doing assessments on smart meters, how you can do assessment on embedded devices and have a positive impact on the infrastructure that you're trying to help. Okay, these are, smart meters are high voltage electricity devices. They're not like your TV. You know, they're, they're not safe if you accidentally try to touch it. You know, certainly a TV can kill you if, it, if you touch it in the wrong spot. But smart meters, if you don't respect them, they will kill you. And so I'm not responsible. Please handle these with care. I've got a special setup in my lab uh, to help protect me as best as I can. I'm very careful all the time. The meter on the side of your house, you don't own that. It might be attached to your house, but it's not yours. If you go trying to do testing on that meter, if you pull it off and try to do assessments on it, if you uh, obtain a tool to let you speak to the optical port, if you do that and they find out, and they've got information back about it and they can point back to you, they're going to provide that information to law enforcement and they're going to prosecute you. This is, this is no different than any other penetration test out there. But because it's on the side of the house, we need to make sure that you guys understand you don't own that. Please do not do assessments on it. Okay, so what we're going to talk about... 
what we're going to talk about is uh, we're going to just talk about smart meters and how they are a part of a larger infrastructure. Then we're going to talk about some of the concerns, uh, you know, that the way criminals might be looking at these a little bit, um, and then uh, go through how they might do their research. How I do my research is the same way that they are going to do the research. So I'm going to show you how they're doing it. And then how we take that research to a de develop assessment tools and actually to de develop attack tools. If you're a criminal, you'll be definitely wanting to attack them. So we've got an optical tool, but then we're going to talk about the mitigations at the very end. Mitigations that are already in place. Okay, so uh, that's really the only, one of the reasons why we're happy about giving this talk is that uh, the mitigations that we're going to go over are implemented in some form or fashion uh, by the majority of the vendors out there. Another reason that, we're happy, that we don't mind talking about this is that the information I'm about to provide you was provided to everybody back in 2009. And Guardians developed with, uh, it, was, uh, it was funded by a consortium of utilities, and we developed that advanced metering infrastructure attack methodology, which is really good for any embedded device. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I successfully used that methodology to teach myself how to assess hardware and then actually uh, generate tools to generate anomalous data um, to help people understand what some of those attacks are going to look like. So this image right here is one of, one of the tools that we use when we're going in to do an assessment, when we're going to help with an architecture review. Um, because each one of these pieces can be different depending on the utility that you go to. They're also going to have legacy devices. So a lot of these things are going to be different. Um, the, uh, uh, obviously on your right hand side, uh, the, the red circle, that's going to be a smart meter. What's going to happen is they're going to, depending on the solution, because a lot of them are different, um, they're going to generate a mesh network with uh, other smart meters. Um, if they have a 900 megahertz radio in them, then they're going to talk to an aggregator at, on a pole top, and then that's going to communicate with the cellular towers and pass the information back to the back end. But some of those meters can actually have uh, cell phone modules in them. So they're actually talking back to the cell phone towers themselves and then back to the back end. Now, when you get to the, the router area, the application firewall area, that's when you're starting to get into the normal business type network. Okay? And so you're going to have, you know, it's going to be similar to any type of businesses that are out there. The, uh, um, the assessment part of that is the same. You're going to have web assessments. You're going to have database assessments. You're going to have network assessments and so forth. But what we're really concerned about here is the stuff in the red because all, all of these things are publicly facing devices. And they're hardware devices, they're embedded devices, and we're going to go over how we'll take a look at these and help people understand what attackers are going to do to these publicly facing devices. So what is a criminal interest? Well, these are some high-level bullet points. I guarantee you that if you walk into any utility right now, they've got a list that is least, at least four times this long because they've been doing this for 100 years. They understand what people are trying to do to them. But these technologies, these new technologies that are externally available are providing the um, attackers with uh, things that they didn't have before, the network capability. So there are new things that are new to them. So we're, we kind of concentrate on this at a high level um, and go uh, deeper uh, when necessary. Um, obviously, the first thing that I, the first question that I'm asked Whenever I tell somebody I'm doing research on smart meters, like, hey, dude, uh, can you give me free electricity, man? I'm like, no, no, I can't. You know, first of all, I wouldn't do it. But second of all, even with all my knowledge about it, even with my understanding of uh, C1218, uh, um, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, my knowledge of smart meters and how they communicate on the back end and their configuration, I couldn't tell you what modification to make to reduce my electricity or to give myself free electricity. I don't want to know. Because all I really need to show is that I can make a modification. And that's what I've done. Um, corporate espionage. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I need to uh, uh, point out an example. The optical port has been used to steal electricity. It has been documented. Brian Krebs uh, broke an article back in February after we uh, um, tried to give this talk in January um, where he revealed a, uh, um, an FBI report that stated that the utility in uh, Puerto Rico had, uh, um, had a problem with uh, insider people stealing the vendor software and then um, uh, reconfiguring people's and businesses' meters for a fee so that they got reduced electricity. 
So we have actually seen this out in the wild, but nobody knew what it would look like. And so that's one of the things that we wanted to try to help them understand. Corpia to espionage, I think we can come up with a whole bunch of scenarios, but consumption rates are really a big deal. Uh, when, when you're talking, trying to understand whether somebody's going to meet production or not meet production, so a utility's clients might not want the, production, or the, uh, the consumption rate uh, usage uh, readily available to people. They, they want it protected by passwords. They want to ensure that nobody's going to get it. Access to the back end resources. And this is one of the, uh, I had a client specifically tell me, I, I asked, okay, what, you know, uh, what is your greatest fear? Tell, so that I can approach it from that standpoint. And he said, I want to know if you can use a meter or an aggregator to hop to other resources. Whether it's the resources that I showed you on the back end, or whether it's other resources maybe in a substation. Because just like any other business, they're going to reuse uh, any of the devices that they can to, uh, um, to provide the, the network connectivity. So some of those substations may, depending on the deployment, actually connect to the same stuff that the AMI meters do. So can I, get, can I get to those? Can I hop that network? And so we look into that to see if that's possible. Now the non-kinetic attack is one of the ones that I have to repeat every single time that I talk to a client and that I talk to a vendor. They've got this thing called a baseball bat attack. I tell them that I can turn off a meter and they say I, I can take a baseball bat to it. Awesome, you can do that, right? But when I walk up to the meter that you hit with a baseball bat, guess what? I know what you did. If I turn it off on the optical port, how long is it going to take you to troubleshoot that? Okay, how long is it going to take you to identify the fact that I turned off the Sprint cell phone tower? Yes, I can drive a truck into this, but you can see I drove a truck into this. But if Sprint goes down because I'm able to disconnect that residential meter right there, how long is it going to take you to figure out whose problem it is? Is it Sprint's problem? Is it the utility's problem? So that's something that they need to consider when they're trying to figure out where they're deploying these meters. And then obviously, um, pretty much everybody in here will knows about hacktivism. They'll use anything that they can to get their point across, and so it definitely needs to be taken into consideration. Now, aggregators on the pole tops. You know, another thing that uh, utilities don't tend to understand is that people are going to want to steal things from pole tops. I mean, before all this stuff started getting deployed, there was transformers up there. Is anybody going to here going to try to steal a transformer? You know, I mean, because you're probably going to die. I'm sure there's instances of people that have tried it, but you know what? This, this right here is providing network connectivity to the back end. So if they determine, if they figure out that they can use this, then yes, they're going to go ahead and figure out a way to sweep the lines off of there and grab that device. Okay, so we help people understand, we help the utilities understand that. Um, actually, the, um, the uh, network interface that I have circled right there, I talked to somebody who has done an assessment on this particular one, and he said that the vendor actually has that network interface locked down very well. There were some other issues that they helped them understand. You know, I just put OMG on there because, yes, there is net, these, these devices have networking capabilities. But only one is right in front of you. Only one can you walk up to in the front, you know, on the side of your house and have the little optical port wink at you. So that's what we're going to concentrate on. Now, when I do my research, I contact the vendors and I ask them for meters. Or when a client hires me to do it, they send me meters and aggregators and connect me back to their back-end network so they can see the data going across. But how are criminals going to get it? Well, there's obviously the insider threat. They're going to go steal it. Um, I believe uh, um, uh, there have been some cases where uh, you can purchase them off eBay or go dumpster diving at the utility and get them. I think those are a little harder to do now. Um, but really, if I can just pay somebody $5 to go grab this one, and I don't want to get anywhere near that because those are exposed power lines, and I think I stayed at least five feet away from that just because I was scared of it. Um, but somebody's going to go grab this, and then all I have to do is go buy an adapter online. I think that, was 20, that uh, adapter right there is $20 online. Of course, please don't just plug that into your wall. It'll power the meter. But if you touch something, um, you're, you're not protected, you're not isolated from the current, so you'll probably die. So uh, please have the proper setup before you attempt to do an analysis on meters. So once they get this meter home, once I open up a meter, what I'm going to see is I'm going to see an, an embedded device. Um, obviously up here on this, uh, where I say danger, 
um, if, even if I uh, unplug the meter, that silver and black device right there that's called a capacitor, it maintains the charge for a certain period of time until it dissipates. That is enough to kill you. So you have to be careful when you're analyzing these, even after you've unplugged them, you have to make sure that is dissipated. Now, when I'm doing my assessments to, to help me do an logical process, I tend to think of it as data, is re data at rest and then data in motion. And so we have micro microcontrollers, memory components, and radios. Those are going to be your data at rest. Firmware on the microcontrollers, firmware and data in the memory components, and then the radios, depending on the type of radio, are either going to have firmware or they're going to be managed by a microcontroller. So I'm going to try to pull that data off, and we'll show you how to do that in just a second. Um, the, uh, but then, all of these have to communicate. So you're going to have connections between uh, the, the microcontroller and the memory component, um, the, the microcontroller and the radio. You're also going to have board-to-board -board connectivity. Okay? And, and what that means is that not all of the metrology boards, the metrology boards are the boards that do the counting, basically. Um, uh, it, it counts how much consumption you have. Uh, and, but then you have to have a network interface to connect back. Some manufacturers put them on the metrology board. Other manufacturers and other, th uh, other solutions actually have a daughter board that connect to the metrology board. And so you can tap those lines as well and get data in motion going between them. And we'll show you about that in just a second. Now, data at rest, if you're familiar with hardware devices, um, you, you recognize some of these images. Um, but really, what it boils down to, to, to make it easy for everybody, is you have components that have pins that are easily accessible. They come out the side. They're easy to tap onto. Um, you can actually interact with them very well if you understand what they expect to see. Um, but other more complex uh, uh, technologies will have ball grid array. And that, that just means that the, the, the connections are underneath the component. It's really good from a security standpoint because these are advanced devices. And so they have multi-level boards. And so sometimes all of those lines that are going out of there, uh, going to these devices, you won't see and won't be able to tap. Okay? But just because I can't tap it doesn't mean I cannot access the data that's on it. And here's an example of both of these. So on the left um, is me uh, attaching onto a, a component where the pins are exposed. I'm actually using the uh, Ardwork Flash utility. Um, it powers the device and it says, hey, give me all your data. And it dumps it out to a file. Excellent. So now I have a file with all the data on there. Um, on the right, the Zeltec Super Pro. That actually handles ball grid array. It's a more expensive method of doing it. Um, I, I can't remember exactly how much that costs, but I can tell you right now, each adapter is $500 a piece. And I might have to buy three or four adapters to actually do an assessment on, the, uh, um, on a particular radio, or I mean a network interface or metrology board. So it all depends on the manufacturer and uh, what state they're in in their development. But if I don't have either of these, I can use custom methods. This top is a, is a good fit. And you can actually pull data from memory components using the good fit. Uh, you might have to write your own uh, firmware in order to allow it to communicate correctly. But it's possible. And that's what we're trying to show. Now, once you get the memory dumped, okay, it, it's not like they have everything marked out very clearly and nice, nicely for you. You also, we don't, we don't have any software that will parse it for us and tell us where the diff, uh, pieces of information are because each meter manufacturer provides this information differently. They write it to different locations within the memory. They use different formats for where they're putting certain information. So we don't really understand that. I mean, I can look at this all day, and actually you can look up at this one right now. There's a security code in there. It's a default security code that hopefully will never make it out into the, uh, into the field, but can anybody tell me which one it is right now? So, no, actually, no, that was a good choice, but no, it's not. Uh, I'm not going to say which one it is, so I don't get in trouble. Um, <laughs> but it, it's actually not that hard, and I'll show you something about that a little bit later. But, you know, it's still difficult. Now, what I do is I use the, um, to help me try to understand some of these during my analysis, is I use some, the ANSI C12 standards, which are built for communications. Okay? Because these are embedded devices. They don't have a lot of CPU. They don't have a lot of time because a lot of times it's, information is coming in on the radio. They don't have a lot of time to do things. So they'll just write it straight from, uh, from receiving the information straight to the memory component. So if I'm lucky, I can understand how they're passing it in their communications. And I should see the same thing 
within memory. So I might be able to identify certain things just by that alone. But it, again, it varies by manufacturer. I, I kind of have to guess. So that's when I turn to data in motion. So I like to get the data at rest first because usually it's, uh, um, uh, it's pretty quick to tell whether or not I'm going to be able to get that information off that device. Um, and then I have it so that I can look at it later. But then the data at motion, as I mentioned, we have uh, component to component communications, but then we also have the board to board, like I said. So the, the, the picture on the, bottom, on the bottom right, okay, you have a metrology board. Uh, the center one is the network interface card. I'm not quite sure what the, um, uh, the, the meter base uh, board is off the top of my head, I can't remember. Um, but I'm more interested in the, uh, the communications between the uh, network interface card and the metrology board. And the reason why is because in some instances, the NIC card has to authenticate to the metrology board. And if it authenticates and I can tap into it, that means I can record it. And that's when we get into data eavesdropping. Okay, so the example that we have here on the left is a microcontroller that is actually driving the radio. It's the small chip that's on the, on the very far left. Okay, I tap into this, uh, um, these are micro grippers because the, uh, these pins are really tiny. Um, I uh, connect those to a, a logic analyzer, which is going to tell me what data is traveling across each one of these pins at, at that exact moment in time. Okay, so actually what I was able to tell from this is I was able to ascertain the hopping pattern that this radio was going to do. Now, the hopping pattern was specific to that radio because they have algorithms to figure it out and they're all individual, but I was at least able to figure this out for this one, um, for this one device. If I don't have pins, ball grid array, and I can't get it off, then I can resort to using hypodermic needles. If I can identify where those leads are, I can push those onto there. The problem with both of these methods, though, is that you know, all it takes is an elbow to bust any one of those things loose. And I mean, the hypodermic needles, you know, it usually takes me about, you know, 10, 15 minutes to set up. If I bump it while I'm trying to uh, um, gather the data and run it, then I got to go through the whole setup process again. So what I do is I look for the debugging ports, uh, the debugging pads, as you see in the bottom right-hand corner. And uh, normally those are broken out for, um, to program a microcontroller, um, to interact with memory. Um, but what this one is that you see right here is it's uh, uh, busting out the connections between two, the, the, uh, the metrology board and the daughter board, the ne network interface card. So now I, can, now I can solder lines to that. Now I have persistent connection. And I can bring those lights out to a, uh, a breadboard. And I can, I, now I can turn the device on and off. I can kick it. And most likely my connection is going to stay. Okay, now I can interact with this, with, with this device much better. And actually, the image on the right, not only am I using a logic analyzer to see that, what's going across, but at this stage, I'm able to sever the lines and actually put in an FTI, FTDI chip. So now I have a USB inter to serial interface that understands these. And the reason why I know I can do this is because I, at this point, identified that the, uh, um, that the device was using async serial. Okay. So now not only can I monitor, but I can interact with the devices as well. But I have to understand how they're going to pass that information. Well, in order for them to make all of those devices work together, all of those different vendors, they've come up with standards, and it's the ANSI C12 standard. Okay? And, it, and these things define how you're going to pass data from, uh, from device to device, okay? So I look, I read over these standards for a week trying to figure out how to just go ahead and write it by itself, okay? But what really helps is seeing the data pass. Um, C1218, it, it was their first start at it. So it, it was the first standard that was developed to, um, uh, so that they had a standard communication interoperability and, but there's, there's, the only security within this is a security code. So in order to initiate a conversation, you have to have the proper code, and then you can keep going. Everything's passed in the clear. You know, and these are how st standards start. 
Um, what they tried to go to, they tried to move to a little bit more secure um, exchange of information. They uh, did C1221. But in my view, C1221 is worse because all it does is it exchanges a, a, a desencrypted token to do um, a mutual authentication, and then it just moves into C1218. So the next security code is the next packet, and we'll see about that in a second. Uh, the next packet is the security code, and it's passed in the clear. All the rest of the exchange is passed into the clear. And actually, because it's not required that you do that mutual authentication, some vendors are bypassing that mutual authentication, changing the bit to say that specifies C1221, and saying, hey, we do C1221, because they changed one byte in their stream. So actually where they want to go is C1222. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, algorithm that they chose to do that was not approved by NIST. So what they have to go do is they, no, no vendors want to implement C1222 because it's not NIST approved. And that's one of the uh, uh, security standard uh, that is uh, being put in place. And so now the committee has to, the ANSI committee has to go back and modify C1222 with some algorithm, encryption algorithm, that's approved by NIST. So that's delaying all the development for these vendors. So what we have here is, an, uh, this is a picture of what I would see if I saw a logical analyzer. Um, uh, it's actually displaying the data that is going across those pins. Uh, I actually selected a, um, a, a specific portion of it. Uh, the transmit, um, actually it's just a flat line across the top. Um, if you look at different portions of it, it, zoom back out, you'll see some data going across there. But what you see right here is just the receive. And so this is the identification service response packet. And actually you can see the byte. All they have to do is change that one byte with the red arrow, the, um, the standard byte. And now they're doing C1221 and they can tell their, their clients that they're doing this securely. Okay. But what, really why I want to point this out is that the Soleil logical analyzer automatically decodes it. If I can tell it what protocol this is using to transmit data, and in this case, async serial, it'll tell me what the bytes are. Okay, it, it actually gives me ways to modify it, so if they're doing something differently, um, then uh, I can tell the tool that, okay, they're, uh, they're doing their serial transmission uh, slightly different. But what's really good is I can export this data to a CSV file. I can export the um, receive line out to a single file, and then I can export the transmit line out to, to an, a separate file. And then from there, and once I've got it, I just pull it into Excel, and I can start marking it. I can start looking at those standards and saying, okay, EE, that's the, S, that's the start packet character. And then the next one is the identity. And actually when I did this, when I got to this point, all of a sudden all of those standards started making sense because they're kind of cryptic at first if you don't actually know what it looks like. So once I got this broken out, I can start labeling it. Awesome. You know, because remember, you know, we're doing a lot of talking, but this is me going through my development process. This is a, somebody that wants to figure out what they can do with this going through their development process. And so this is one of the next steps. So now I understand what this is. I can identify the different components of a single packet, but now I merge them and I did this by hand, I merged those two streams by hand, and now I can see the packets as they go through. I can see the request and the response patterns. So it starts with the identification, then it goes to the neg negotiation and the login. And I got to the security, I'm scrolling through this, and I got to the security, and I'll, after I started labeling things, I was like, wait a minute, I got the security code. Awesome. You know, so I had achieved one of my steps, and, and, I, and I felt really good about it. You know, I mean, so I've identified through my research that I can pull this from communications, okay? So that's a good thing. But actually the next thing is probably the better thing and that's because what it does is it shows me what actions uh, are being accomplished. How are they accomplishing actions? How are they reading from tables? How are they writing to tables? How are they running procedures which actually performs a function? So now I have an understanding of that as well and I can start building tools. Actually, the, the first tool that I built was I hated doing all that by hand, so now I have a parser, and this is actually the, the first tool in our toolkit. Um, it actually takes a receive file and takes a transmit file, puts them together, labels them properly. I still have to go through and colorize it so that it, it uh, pops out in my eye, um, but it'll at least label it um, with the exception of the data packets. So it, it's a really good tool. It saves a lot of time.
And while I'm developing that tool and I'm looking at those spreadsheets, I start looking at it and I'm like, wait a minute. They send the same packets every single time. And it's slightly different depending on the timing, but it's essentially the same every single time. And I knew from my experience developing MS, MSP430 um, disassemblers and emulators that I can build tables of tables to help me grab the data and be, build the data and be able to send it faster. So I just did that. I just made a, a, a table of every single packet that I knew I was going to see response and uh, um, a request and response and, and now I can start sending this data on the FTDI chip that you saw me plugged into my breadboard earlier. Now I can start sending those packets. And now I have advanced persistent tether because I can send data, I can, I'm constantly connected to it and, um, and I can directly interact with it. And actually in this situation right here, like I said, I had severed the lines uh, between, the, uh, between the metrology board and the NIC, and I just started timing, uh, I just started timing my sends, my requests. So I sent the identification packet, waited a second, I think it was, it was, I think it was actually a second. So I waited a second, and then I sent the uh, negotiation packet. I didn't care what it was sending back to me. Well, I do care because I want to make sure that I'm right, so I monitored it on my logic analyzer, but now I'm just doing a replay attack. Send, send, send. I sent the security packet, it sent me back an OK. Woohoo! I'm logged into the meter now. I can do whatever I want. And so I built a tool to do it. I built a tool that just sends packet timing so that it, uh, so that it does read tables, it runs procedures. Does it actually write to tables? It's been a little while since I've actually used this one. Um, I can read all the tables uh, on the meter so I can pull all the information out. But the problem is, is that I'm still physically connected to the meter. I still have all those lines poking out. You know, if I'm just doing it in my house, you know, it, it, it's really no big deal. But if, I, if I'm doing it on the side of my house, somebody's going to notice all these lines poking out. So it's a step in the right direction, but it's not necessarily exactly what I wanted to be, which is talking to the optical port. You know, and through our experience, you know, the, the reason why I was happy at this point in knew I was ready to move on is because I knew they were using C1218, the same stuff that I was learning from the board in the board to board communications. I already knew from my knowledge that I needed that information to communicate with the optical port. So it started winking at me again. But I have to understand what the optical port is made of so I know how to communicate with it. Well, it's just IR LEDs. Okay? It's, and it's actually outlined in the specification, the C1218 specifications. So you can build your own. Um, these are the standard. Uh, they're supposed to be built to a standard, but each manufacturer, um, they generally stick to the standard that you see here on the, the left-hand side of the screen. Um, but as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, some people do modify it a little bit. What's great is the one on the left-hand side of the screen, that's a metal plate. Because most of the optical ports have a magnet on there. You just set it on there, and then you don't have to touch it. You can just work with it. So infrared LEDs. Well, the first thing I thought of was, you know, TV remote control, stereo remote controls. Well, we've got plenty of open source tools to help with that. So that's the first thing that I started looking into. And I almost instantly figured out that I won't be able to use those. They don't do it the same way as uh, your TV remote control. Um, I'm, I, I can't remember exactly um, what the difference is, but basically what we had to revert to is we had to buy a commercial optical probe. We actually bought these other two things over here. Um, so, you know, I can mess with my TV if I want to now. Um, but I couldn't mess with a meter with these things. So I, we went out and actually we bought this one right here from Probe Tech. You can get them online for $350. I think it might be actually a little bit cheaper now. Um, but it's still kind of expensive. You know, I mean, obviously we're trying to show that we can do cheap solutions. Um, but as soon as I got this, I plug it in and the first thing I notice is I get a TTY USB, zero, USB to serial port. They've just got an FTDI chip in there. Woohoo! I'm halfway there because I've already got something that will communicate with this, or at least the st start to communicate with it. Now, $350 is a little expensive. Um, so what I did is I went uh, one of the probes, uh, uh, one of the um, IR uh, dongles that you saw on the previous slide was uh, uh, made by Iguana Works. We actually contacted them. They're down in Florida. 
They do it as a side job. And we said, hey, there's an open source project online. Can you guys build some of these for us? And said, sure. So InGuardians funded uh, at the start of this project. Now, it's, it's not finished yet. We're still working on it um, because they've never seen a, a, they, I had to explain to them what smart meters were actually. Um, so, uh, so they started developing it without an actual smart meter. They just used the specs online. So we're still troubleshooting this. But the reason why I wanted them to do this is not only so that it can connect USB, but I also said, hey, build me one that has a serial output. And actually, you can see right here, it's turned sideways, but that's an XB module. It speaks Zigbee. So now, if I get this up and running, now I can have remote control access to my dongles. Okay, and that, that's what we're going to shoot for. But right now, we're not there yet. Right now, we're still trying to figure out how to communicate with the meter. And, and what do I need? Well, I've already got, I'm already able to send data that the meters understand. I just don't understand the responses. And I can't respond intelligently to the responses. So I just need to build in that intelligence. Okay? And that's what we actually did. OptiGuard is the client that the tool that we use through this development, through this research, uh, to actually communicate with the um, uh, optical port on meters. Okay, if you weren't in here at the beginning, I need to say this. The meter that's on the side of your house is not yours. You cannot do testing on it without permission. Please don't do that. All right. So, uh, OptiGuard, what is it? Basically, it's just a bunch, it's a, uh, it, it's a tool that leverages the uh, um, Python, the C1218 Python mod modules that we built to communicate with the meters. It just leverages that and provides us with a menu interface to do all of the stuff I've been talking about. Read tables, write to tables, run procedures. It does stuff such as um, uh, understanding whether uh, certain meters uh, like to, some meters like to see the negotiation um, a packet, and some meters don't want to see it. It's really depending on the, how the vendor has, uh, how the media manufacturer has implemented it. So we've made some, uh, um, config, or put some functions in here that will modify it, the functionality so that you can speak to different meters. Uh, you can read multiple tables. You know, one of the things that we came, that came out of uh, this testing is that um, not all of, not every single meter manufacturer uh, protects every table. There, there might be some configuration data that they think is, uh, um, doesn't necessarily uh, need to be protected by a security code, by a security password. Some vendors protect every single table on there. But, you know, it's, but they don't tell the vendors that some of this information is available without a password. What our tool is doing is it's providing the utilities with the capability to look at, to see on these meters, what information can I pull off without a security code? And then they can turn around, back around to the third party service provider or to the meter vendor and say, hey, why aren't we protecting this? We would like to protect it. Let's, let's get a change implemented. So we can read out all the tables, uh, some of the configuration to, uh, Table 00 is actually a configuration table. We'll parse that for you. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that um, the, the configuration table tells you which uh, tables they're allowing uh, you to read and write to, to read from, which procedures have been programmed on the meter. But everybody lies. You know, there's obfuscation techniques. Just because it's in the configuration doesn't mean that it, there's not a necessarily a table um, uh, that isn't being displayed by that. Well, we can tell you whether or not we can read the tables because we'll just read everything out. We'll just call every single table number and read it out. Uh, procedures, run procedures. We can run multiple procedures. Oh, you know what? I forgot to mention something. And it's actually very important because this is the bullet point that our client asked us to put in. It's the first one, in bold red, of course. And that in order to use this tool on a meter, I have to have the security code. Okay, so if I got a hold of this tool, if I got a hold of OptiGuard or got a hold of any other tools that are associated with communicating with the optical port, if I want to do anything, I need to have the security code because every meter is going to protect their um, security related procedures and tables by the security code. So I can't just walk up, I can't just download this, walk up to a meter and start changing configurations or anything like that. It's something that I left out in the first presentation. It absolutely needs to be in here so that everybody understands that. 
So basically, I'm just giving you a menu-based interface, giving the clients a menu-based interface so that they can run, so that they can do things that the vendor software does not. Now, let's talk about some of the things that, uh, that we found. We, we found some of the, via our brute force runs, one of the things that they're worried about is whether or not we can disconnect a meter. Only residential meters let you disconnect them. Um, actually, uh, uh, function number 21, I'm not sure if you can read the, the font, but it says run procedure 21, direct load control. That is a standards table. Um, everybody should be implementing the standard tables the same way if they choose to implement them. So by setting it to zero or setting it to 100%, I can disconnect the meter or reconnect the meter. But not every manufacturer does it that way. They can make their own manufacturer procedures. They can say that, okay, procedure 21 is not available. In other words, I'm going to hide the disconnect procedure from you. Okay, fine, fine. I'll just run every procedure at the, one after another to see if it works. Actually, the first time I didn't send any data because my tool allows me to do that, it didn't work. Then the next run, I sent a run procedure and I sent it a character of zero, zero. Just a zero. And the meter turned off. And then I sent a one, I identified which procedure it was, I sent that procedure a one, and the meter turned back on. Woohoo! I did what they didn't want me to do. So, um, but it, you know, it definitely showed that I can do that without the vendor software. And I can identify those with my software without having knowledge of uh, you know, what the manufacturer, act, where the manufacturer actually tried to hide it. One of, one of my big worries though is the, the last one, the brute forcing those procedures for some meter manufacturers, um, uh, it didn't like that at all. Uh, I, was, I was running it on the meter and I looked over and all of a sudden I saw that the display said uncalibrated. So I called up my contact and I'm like, hey, my meter says uncalibrated. It's like, yeah, you have to send that back now. I'm like, I'm like, dude, did I just brick the meter? He's like, yes, you just bricked the meter. And a lot of vendors, or a lot of utilities will try to fix the meters in house. He told me, the utilities can't fix that meter in the house. You have to send it back to the vendor. So, you know, I still have to have a valid C1218 password in order to do that. But how is my client going to know that, that, that that's a possibility? Okay, they have to be concerned about that. They have to ask the vendor, how are you addressing this? And without our tool, they would have never known that functionality was in there. They would have never known they would have had that problem. So basically, this is what we do. I mean, obviously, this is built to me. I understand. I have tried to make the user interface a, a, as friendly as possible for when I provide it to the people that work in the utility industry. Um, but it's, it's highly configurable. These are just Python modules that are providing C1218 communications. So I actually, in my toolkit, provide a, a, um, a client framework where you can start without any of these things. Basically, it just provides quit, um, uh, log on, uh, and terminate. And then you can build all your, you know, build your own functionality associated with the meter that you're working on. Now, one of the things that you can do that you don't require a C1218 uh, password is, and it's uh, um, the same with any other authentication, is that you can attempt to brute force that authentication. And when I started thinking about that, I started thinking back to the memory that I dumped before. You know, because obviously I need something to use as a passcode. Okay, um, I can make up stuff. You know, I can make an intelligent one. Uh, you know, uh, a utility name, vendor name, um, Donald Duck, whatever. Okay, um, but if I want to really do it, and I know, and I believe that the password is in the data that I grabbed, well, I just make every password that I can out of there. I just take one byte, make a password. Take the two bytes, make a password. Take three bytes because they're all padded by twenty. That's the standard. So if the utilities, some utilities doing it a little bit differently then this wouldn't work, but you just adjust to what they're doing. So in that memory that I showed you, in that memory dump I showed you before, I ran this tool to extract all possible pass passcodes out of it, and then I ran unique on it so that I wasn't running them multiple times, and I got 12,277 passwords. Now I can run each one of those to see if it lets me log in. And if they haven't done something to prevent that by obfuscating it, by um, by, by hashing it or something like that, I'm eventually going to get a successful login. But actually because of that exchange, I have to do that exchange each time, it takes me almost seven hours to run through that file. And I'll tell you right now, I've never gotten my tool to communicate with the meter for longer than 20 minutes at one time. 
So it's still very difficult to do this. I don't have logic built in to just start up where it left off. I mean, I can do that. I just haven't gotten there yet. And it actually, you know, I've, I've proved my point here, right here. But, you know, the, these are going to tell things, you know, obviously I'm going to get a whole bunch of fell logins. Are, are they logging that? Well, according to the standards, they're supposed to be. But one of the things that we ran across is that one third-party solution could pull logs from one meter, but they couldn't pull logs from another meter. And the issue never came up until we said, hey, where are the logs from my brute force logins? Well, we got them over here, but we've got a problem here. Oh, really? You want to tell us about that, please? So, so they're addressing that, obviously, right now. Now, we were going to do a demo. We thought about doing a demo. But then, actually, we started thinking about what would a demo do? It would show you one meter that I chose to put on here that I, uh, that I obfuscated so you couldn't tell what it was. I'd run my procedure. It would go click clunk, and that's all it would show you. It wouldn't show you the mitigations that they have on the back end to help detect and prevent those things. So we decided not to do a demo. It wasn't really fair because you know, there are a whole bunch of meter vendors out there, and these apply to these uh, concerns apply to all of those meters. So we're not going to pick on just any one. But what we are going to do is we're going to talk about the mitigations that can help prevent and detect. And as I mentioned before, these mitigations are things that many vendors, utility vendors, are, are already putting in place uh, for their meters. Obviously, we've already talked about it. If you're going to put a residential meter somewhere that has a disconnect switch, you want to think about where you're putting it. You know, a cell phone tower is probably not the best way to do it. And even if you disable the disconnect on that residential meter, if it takes a procedure to turn it back on, I'm going to figure out how to turn it back on. Okay? So, you, so they have to think about where they're deploying some of those residential meters. Yes, sir. Um, and then. Obviously, uh, um, just like anywhere else, we want to vary our uh, security codes um, throughout our infrastructure. You have to remember that they're deploying a million, potentially a million meters in a deployment. Okay? And so having a million passwords, actually, that's a security risk in and of itself. But they can think of logical ways to split it up, and I've got a few on there. But actually, what I tell them is, go talk to your field technicians. What is going to be best for them? Okay, so obviously the utilities have to take a look at this, and really it's not a, that's not a vendor thing. It, this is a, a utility implementation problem. So when I was walking through making the changes, you know, I told you, woohoo for the times that I found the security code, woohoo for the times that I was actually able to successfully make a change. But my biggest, my biggest woohoo was when I was sitting talking to one of the clients. I said, okay, I'm making a change. And he's looking at his back end interfaces, and it says, hey, look, on your meter, I see that it says a configuration change. I'm like, screenshot right now. Because now he's immediately identified that I made a configuration to, uh, change to a meter out in the field. And now he has something that he can show to his operators. When you see this occur, you know something has been modified. And to me, that was the biggest thing. Actually, that's what made me feel comfortable about giving this talk is because they can identify configuration changes. They can identify when I turn a meter on or off. And I mean, it might take a little bit of time, but as long as their operators are trained, as long as they have incident response procedures, now they have a method to, uh, to look into it and address it. Uh, more mitigations that are, are already in place, tamper alarms. Um, uh, sometimes those are hard to do. You can get a lot of those, so they have to figure out a, a way to do that. Um, toggle the optical port. Uh, there are some issues with safety on that, um, but, uh, but it's some of the things that people actually do. Data storage. Uh, you know, I mean, if, if we're going to protect the data, if, if you don't want people to see the uh, security code, then you can do stuff like encryption, but it has to be done properly. And now you're adding keys that people can actually grab. So you know, they, they have to come up with a logical solution. Encryption might be the solution, but it, it's not necessarily the only one. Um, configuration integrity checks, that that's what I was just talking about where I gave my big yoo-hoo, because that's how they're doing it. They're uh, um, doing a, a integrity checks on the firmware that's on the devices, and they're doing integrity checks on the configuration, and all of those are managed on the back end. So as long as I protect those back end resources, then I should be able to identify these things in a timely manner. Now, IR uh, uh, authentication tokens. 
Basically, this is just some, some of the media manufacturers won't let you communicate with the optical port unless you pass the right data at the very beginning. Now, you might think that it breaks the standard a little bit, but it's just on their meters. Actually, everything that follows that initial token is all C1218, C1219, C1221. You know, so it's not really breaking it that much, and it keeps me, if I don't have it, if I don't have that token, then I never get to communicate it at all. I don't get to brute force it. I don't get to try any of my uh, um, tool on there. But it doesn't mean that I can't build that into my tool, you know, because it's flexible. So I can do that. So uh, they need to take that into consideration as well. Um, a microcontroller to whatever. You know, obviously the standard is moving towards C1222. Start thinking about it now. You know, that's what our recommendation to them. Um, uh, but also obfuscating protocols. People, one, one vendor does this and it does it very well. They don't write the security code sequentially. So my brute force technique to grab every password wouldn't work. It's all in there, but they've split it up. Obfuscating how you transmit between components, how you transmit between boards. If it takes me a while, to, it might take me a while and to figure it out, but the longer it takes me to figure it out, you know, the, the more costly it is to me. You know, from a, res from a security researcher standpoint, it, it makes it kind of hard, but eventually we'll get it. But at least it takes us longer. So OptiGov Offspring, these are some of the things that I thought of off the top of my head. You guys, while you're, I'm talking about this, have probably thought about a lot more. Um, the wireless optical port readers, so you saw an example of that with my Zigbee thing. Um, it, it takes 1,000 to 2,000 smart meters to impact the whole grid. So uh, uh, the electrical grid in a certain area, you have to impact at least between 1,000 and 2,000 homes at, depending on the time um, and how much usage is going on. So will I be able to do this with a whole bunch of cheap devices? Maybe. I'd have to basically do it with a, a cell phone network and stuff like that. It would be very difficult. I'd have to actually deploy each one by hand because I have to interact with each one physically right in front of it. So I would have to go up and deploy that and then walk away and hope that it stayed there. So it's still a difficult, difficult attack, but what if I can do that? Um, optical spraying, if I can stand here and point my LED at the meter and make a modification and I never touch it, did I do anything to the meter? Can you prosecute me? You know, I've made a change on it, but I never touched it. I never went past the gate. So, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily know that, you know, this is probably the hardest one to implement, but who am I to say what's possible and what's not? I mean, because we already know that you can just send and you don't have to worry about the, what the responses are on some of these protocols. Uh, wireless hardware sniffers, and, and this is getting into, although you could do this on a meter, but this is more for the aggregation points on top. If I can do some research on one, figure out how I want to tap it so that it communicates back to me, then I just jump up on a pull top, open it up, stick my stuff in there, close it back up, and it's communicating back to me. If I can do that, and your technicians have never opened it up, you never got a tampo alarm, you need to be concerned. Because now I'm basically tapping into your, your hardware. So, you know, these are uh, one of the things we think of. Um, obviously, I talked about being able to detect the, the hopping patterns for the radios. Okay, that's, that's really the next step. You know, do, and so the, what the... Uh, utilities need to start asking is the, the, the vendors for their network interface card, what happens if somebody figures out what your hopping pattern is so that they can snoop on any radio that's out there? Can you change that? Is it a firmware change? You know, what, what needs to occur to do that? They need to start asking those questions because that's really where I'm looking next. You know, after I finish this talk, I'm going to go talk to Atlas. I'm going to go talk to some other people that are doing this because my research is converting to this. I'll still keep looking at this and doing it as part of my assessment, but our next step is frequency hopping. Yes, our talk got pulled at ShmooCon, but that doesn't mean we didn't have any support. Ed Barrisett from Elster, before my ShmooCon talk, provided me code input to make sure I was able to work with certain meters. He provided me input to the, this presentation so that it was accurate and so that I didn't say anything that was damaging to the utilities. But Robert Former from iTron, uh, was an excellent source of guidance and encouragement. ITRON is actually implementing this in their, uh, um, for their security research. So as they're developing their hardware, they're using our tools, 
along with other tools that are coming out of the security industry, but they're being proactive about it. There are other, other vendors out there that have said, hey, this is great. I don't have a tool to do this for my development team. They've asked not to be named, but they're also implementing this the OptiGuard in, in their toolkits for their development. And then everybody else in my life, I want to thank them as well. My name is Don Weber. I work for InGuardians. Please contact me um, via that email if you need any additional information. My cards are up here. Um, other than that, we can go to questions. We have time for questions, sir? Five minutes. Are there any questions? And I believe there's, there's a microphone right up here that will help everybody understand it. I'll try to repeat it. Okay. Well, just out of curiosity, I'm wondering if it would be possible um, seeing that you can read the data table. Hang on, I'm going to come to you. Just a moment, sir. Okay. I was going to yell at you. <laughs> I, was, I was wondering if, uh, from reading the dav data tables, if you, were to able, if you were able to look at that over time, and then you were able to correlate, correlate that with, like, meter usage, and... Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, okay. will, you, will you go ahead and start over so that yeah. I hear it all? Certainly. Uh, I was just curious if over time as you, if you were able to read from the data tables and say you collected a, a fair amount of data from that, would, you, would it be possible to maybe correlate some of those tables with changes in the uh, gas and utilities usage? Um, say if you were looking at a bill and you're, you're looking at the usage and you're looking at it increase over time, if you were able to do any type of data analysis between the utilities usage and the change in tables over time, could you kind of? Hey, yeah, I mean, if, if you have reading, if you can read the data out and you have the data, you can do any type of manipulation that you want on it. Okay. So, uh, as I said, you might be able to do it, you know, and I believe in Europe that they have uh, um, some tools that were able to do it on some older meters. Okay. Um, uh, uh, some of the meters that are be deploying, being deployed in North America are slightly different. Like I said, some allow you to access that information, that data, without an authentication token or a code, and, and some don't. But once you have that data, it's just like any other data. You can do any type of manipulation that you want. The utility industry is taking that into consideration right now. Yeah. They actually have data privacy groups to understand what information is being stored on the meters and on the back end and they're helping the utilities, they're helping the vendors understand how that could put the users, whether it's a business or an individual, at risk. So they're already, they're, they're looking into it, sir. Cool. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Who is responsible for pulling your talk at ShmooCon? The next question, please. <laughs> Thank you, Atlas. Are there any other questions? Uh, raise your hand if you're moving up. Okay, we got some gentlemen moving up right now, uh, too. Go ahead, please. You're already there, sir. Um, the, the attacks you, you presented all involved at one point opening up the meter to at least try and brute force the security code. Do you have any ideas what type of attacks you would, you would investigate if you wanted to do something that didn't involve opening up the meter at all just through the optical port? So if I understand your question, please don't walk away. Is, uh, is there anything I can do now that I have a tool to interact with it um, can I do additional things to attempt to attack it, to uh, try to give it, uh, give me access or, or, or anything like that? Is that it, your question? Um, if you have a meter that you've never opened up, do okay. you have any ideas how you would attack it from the optical port alone with the information you have now? Well, and, and that's what the tool does. So if, if you understand, so you don't necessarily, you, you probably still need to do um, uh, some work to obtain the security code. Um, but obviously you can walk up, if, if it communicates with the meter already, so in other words, if you get the exchange, um, you know, unfortunately, since we didn't do a demo, uh, you didn't see that um, the, the response, it, it recognizes the responses. So if I send something, it says, no, that's not what I'm expecting, I'll see an error message come back. But if I see an OK come back, that, or a uh, response that I expect, that means that I did a, a good, uh, sent it a good packet, now I can just continue forward. And so, yes, I can do assessments on meters via the optical port without doing any hardware assessment. But, you know, I can't tell, tell you how far I can get. But that's why that we have the uh, brute forcing capabilities. That's why we have the fuzzing capabilities built in there so that, you know, I can send my table reads, but, uh, you know, as a part of that read, I can, you know, make that packet huge to, to make sure that it doesn't, you know, if, if I make that packet, you know, if I do my authentication 
through the um, normally, and then I get to a certain packet, and I you know I send you know 5,000 characters. You know, does that meter reboot? If it does, then we might have an issue on the microcontrollers. And so we can test those conditions now, and we don't even need to open it up. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, we're, we're being asked to, uh, um, uh, to wrap it up. So I thank you, everybody, for coming out. I really appreciate it. Um, please contact me. If you need